class. He had something come up this morning. He wasn't able to make it. Uh, and so he will be back next week. So if you're a Dr. Jern Jones person, he'll be back next week, and we'll work to get uh, that recorded. So he'll pick back up with week two next week. And then at some, at some point over the next five weeks, we'll get the missing lecture recorded so he can still get all of his material in, even though he'll have five weeks. So we'll, we'll work to get that and get that posted so that you won't miss anything. Um, but he'll, he'll be back next week. Uh, I will tell you, I'm going to end up leaving a little early, trying to close a little early today. Um, Hannah is with, uh, is with her parents in Glasgow. She went down to visit them today. Elizabeth got really sick last night um, and won't stop throwing up, and they're trying to get an IV in. And so I'm going to uh, probably won't teach the whole time today, uh, and I'm going to close up shop early and, and head down there to help her um, as they, so I've got my phone here, so if I pause for a minute and I'm trying to just keep updated on what's happening, uh, just know I'm reading text messages, but they're appropriate ones. Once uh, I, I need to read just to, to make sure I know what's going on. Elizabeth is, yeah. Started throwing up last night and then can't keep her from throwing up. So um, they're there at the urgent care that's a part of the hospital there in Glasgow. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm going to close up a little early and, and I'll head that way. Um, but if you also, if you picked up one last week, um, you can use this. This is the same booklet. This will be the book, booklet that we use for the entire six weeks. Um, I'll try to always have extras back there in case you lose one um, or you forget yours, but, but each of the, the six weeks are in here. So if you picked up one of these, this is what we're going to cover today, um, beginning week two as we walk through mission. So if you're, if you're a person who's in Dr. Jones' class, you're just coming over, you missed, obviously, last week, but I don't want you to be totally lost as to what we're doing. This is a class called To the End uh, that is focused on the Great Commission, that our responsibility to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to, to make disciples, to see people come to, to faith in Jesus. And so we, we talked a little bit last week about what that looks like, the mark of a discipleship, and, and how, how Christ has called us to that from Matthew 28. This week what we're going to look at is, is disciples are, place, are placed for the missions. How, how does God place us, what is God doing in our lives to put us in places and have opportunities to be able to share, uh, to share the gospel with, with people. So uh, if you've got your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to put it up here, but it, you can put this much text, sometimes it's hard to read. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16, and we're going to read down through verse 34. This is the, the story of Paul and Silas and, and the Philippian jailer. That, as we're, we're talking today about the way that God places us in particular places for the sake of the mission, for the sake of making disciples, uh, this is a, an excellent opportunity, this, this passage, for us to see what it looks like, to understand what God has done, to understand how God places us in particular places that we might uh, that we might share the gospel. So uh, let's look at Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. Or ver, re, Acts 16, beginning in verse 16, sorry. And as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the, garment, the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, it's important to, to understand here that the jailer was just charged with keeping them safe, right? to keep them there. He, he goes a step further. He puts them in the, in the inner part of the prison, and he puts them in stocks, which are extremely uncomfortable. He doesn't have to do that. That's not his order. His order is just to keep them safe. The jailer goes above and beyond, right, extra to make their life miserable. He puts them in the stocks. Verse 25, and about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were fastened, were unfastened. rather. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. 
And they took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Now, Paul and Silas are here. With the, the way they get into prison is there's this demon-possessed girl who is following them. I find it at least a little interesting that, that Paul becomes annoyed at her, and that's why he casts the demon out. Right? He's, he's annoyed at this girl yelling out at him. So he casts the, the demons out, and because he casts the demons out, he costs this girl's owner money. And she was essentially a fortune teller, so they get put into prison, which we would see almost always as a bad thing. If you're on your way to church to, or to work tomorrow, and you get pulled over, and they ask you, are you a Christian? And you say yes, and you get put into prison. Right? Most of us are not going to rejoice and say, I'm so glad that I got a chance to go to prison for Jesus. Paul and Silas, they go to prison. Not only did they go, but we saw the jailer goes above and beyond to make their life miserable. Right? He doesn't just do what he's supposed to. He makes it even worse. He puts them in the inner part of the prison. He puts them in the stocks. And, the God, and God comes. He brings this earthquake to open up the prison. And the, the jailer, when he sees that the doors are open, is ready to kill himself. Why would he be ready to kill himself? Yeah. Yeah, the, he's going to be held responsible for this prison break. Even though it's not his fault, even though it's an earthquake that did this, he knows he's going to be held responsible uh, and that it's going to be better off if he kills himself. Right? He, at, least, he, at least in his mind, he feels he's better off. Right? If I might as well kill myself as opposed to what the Romans will do to me. So uh, he, 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 kills, he is about to kill himself. Now notice here, Paul and Silas stop him. This person who threw them in jail, who not only put them in jail, but went out of his way to make their life hard, went out of his way to put them in the stocks, they stop him and say, we're all here. They don't want him to kill himself. They, they don't want him to harm himself. But instead have this opportunity, which he says, which what we all want to hear from the unbelievers in our life, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Right? He, he's saying, I, I, I want to trust this God of yours. And then Paul and Silas have an opportunity to share the gospel with him. He comes to faith, he and his, and his whole family. Now, there's much more here that, we're, that we could say that we're not going to say. But the, the point that I want you to see out of this is that jailer and his family never get saved if Paul and Silas don't end up in prison. Right? That, that God uses even what we would see as a bad thing. He uses Wrong things, that these people throwing Paul and Silas in prison, in prison for preaching the gospel. God uses that to put them in just the right spot, in just the right scenario, and that they might be able to share the gospel. And this Philippine jailer and his whole family would come to faith, that God placed them in that prison. So that rather than Paul and Silas being angry or being frustrated or being bitter towards this jailer or being uh, wanting to get revenge because he's hurt them and they're, they're glad now that he's hurt, instead they care more about his his soul than they do about their own comfort. That, that this is part of what we see throughout the whole life of Paul, is that Paul was always seeking to be aware of where God had placed him. So you, you think even the, the letter uh, to the Philippians, right? In Philippians, Paul talks about the way that he has been able to share the gospel, that, that as Paul writes the letter to the Philippians, he's under house arrest, that, that uh, the Roman guards, the, the uh, Praetorian guard, the, the sort of the elite of the elite of the guards, are chained to him every six to eight hours. A new soldier would come and be chained to Paul uh, and would have to sit with him and keep watch over him. And so as Paul writes, he, he writes to the Philippians to say, I don't want you to think that the gospel is being hindered. Instead, the, the, the gospel was going throughout all of Caesar's household. And so at the end of the letter, he's able to say to them that Caesar's, the believers in Caesar's household send you greetings. Well, how do you think believers got in Caesar's household? What do you think Paul was doing every six to eight hours as, as he got a new guard? And they came in and said, hey, Paul, how you doing? They said, hey, I'm good. How are you? And they have a little, maybe a little small talk. And then Paul begins to share with them, hey, have you heard the story of Jesus? He begins to share with them, do you know why I'm in, under house arrest? And then Paul uses this time in which these guards are literally chained to him. He has a captive audience to share the gospel with these men. That he sees his imprisonment not as an impediment to the gospel, but he says, if I'm here, God has placed me here that the gospel might continue to go forward. I'm in change, but Paul says the gospel is not. That Paul understood that, that God places us in particular places, in good ways and sometimes in hard, in hard ways, right? In, in ways that involve suffering for the sake of the kingdom so that we might make disciples. This is what we're called to do, to understand where it is that God has, has put us in our life. So you must understand, if you're looking for the first blank, you must understand your relationships with lost persons if you are to be evangel evangelistically effective. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is the lost people in your life, is the, the ways in which we understand who are the lost people in our life, the relationships that God has given us. 
you are uniquely placed and that you have opportunities, you have open doors, you have relationships that I don't have. And I have uh, opportunities and open doors and relationships that you don't have. That given your, your job and your family and your education and your life experiences, that you are uniquely placed to reach certain people that I am not as well placed to reach and vice versa. God has placed us in particular places, put us together in certain ways to give us opportunities. Now, I want to, to, to talk about at least a couple ways that we might misunderstand this. I, I want you to understand, as we talked a lot today about relationship evangelism, about using the relationships that we have, the places that God has put us in order to share the gospel, I, w- I want to be clear to say, I'm not saying that a relationship is required in order to share the gospel. It's not true. Right, so sometimes in saying we care about relationship evangelism, sometimes our relationship evangelism is all relationship and no evangelism. Right, that we use that as an excuse to not share the gospel because we're still building the relationship and we'll do it later. Right, I, want to hear you, I want you to hear me say that a relationship is helpful, but it is not required in order to share the gospel. Can you meet somebody in the line at Kroger and in the course of a conversation get to the gospel? I believe you can. Right? And you don't have to meet them and spend six months getting to know them before you share the gospel with them. Right? Paul didn't have a relationship with this jailer. Right? And what relationship he did have was bad. This guy had thrown him in the stocks, and yet Paul was able to share the gospel with him. So I'm not saying that relationships are necessary, that you should never share the gospel with people unless you've de- first developed a relationship with them. We're going to talk about why relationships are helpful and how to utilize those and how to, uh, to use those for the sake of the kingdom, to think in that way. But I don't want you to use that as a category to say, therefore, I won't be open to these one-off opportunities that the Lord may bring to me. Right? If we're honest, God may bring us lots of opportunities like that that we're unaware of because we're not looking for them. We're not thinking about sharing the gospel with the stranger that we strike up a conversation with in Kroger. or We're not thinking about sharing the gospel with the person that we meet in the hallway uh, at work. We're not thinking in those terms because we're thinking all relationship. So even as we're going to talk about a lot about relationships, uh, they're not necessary. You don't have to have a relationship in order to share the gospel, though they are helpful. Second piece I want you to understand is that God, in his sovereignty, has given us these relationships that we might be able to share the gospel with them. Everything in your life is on purpose. Nothing in your life is random. No relationship you have, no place you work, no opportunities or access you have is by chance. That God is not surprised by the relationships in your life. God is not up there thinking and wondering, well, well, you know, they got this new job. I wonder what I might be able to do with that, right? That's not how God operates. God is sovereign over everything in your life, that none of the things in your life are by accident, that God has placed you in certain places for certain purposes that you might use and leverage these relationships that you have for the sake of the kingdom. So we, we trust God is using these things in our life. So when Paul and Silas go into prison, it's not that God makes lemon, lemonade out of lemons, right? But Paul and Silas have this understanding, if we're in prison, God has a purpose for us here. There's a reason we've been placed here. And so they're looking, what is the reason we've been placed for? What, what is it that God would have us to do here that we might be able to have the gospel go forward? And they, they see this Philippine jailer and they have an opportunity. So I'm not, I, I want to say both sides. Relationships are not necessary to share the gospel, but relationships are incredibly helpful. And we should do everything we can to, in our relationships, show the love of Jesus and share the gospel with those that we have opportunity. Right? Both things are true. God has placed us in these particular places for a particular reason. So... Let's talk about concentric circles of concern. So oftentimes, one of the reasons, I think we talked about this a little bit last week, that we're sometimes hesitant to share the gospel with people is because it feels like this big, massive task, right? Taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, making disciples of all nations. It feels like this really massive task that we don't really know where to start. Sometimes when we have this big thing in front of us, we, it's easier not to start it than to try to figure out what part do I have in this. And so if my goal as a, Christ, as a Christian, right, my responsibility as a believer is to take the gospel to all the nations, well, that seems awfully big. And I, I, I don't think I can do that. And so I, it's sometimes difficult, well, what, what place do I fit into there, right? So this, the Great Commission is for all the church, where to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That doesn't mean that every single believer is going to play the exact same role in how the gospel gets to the ends of the earth. You are not responsible to play your role and everybody else's role. You are not responsible to be the church. You are responsible to be your part of the body. So God does not expect the finger to be the foot, or the foot to be the finger. God does not expect the eye to be the hand, or the hand to be the eye. What does God expect? 
for the eye to be the eye, and the hand to be the hand, and the foot to be the foot. This is the way that Paul describes the body to the, as he writes to the Corinthian church. Each of us are gifted differently. Each of us are a part of the body. So for you, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, might it mean that you do what Kenny and Sherman Morris did? Kenny was a retired farmer and truck driver and was called, felt called to the mission field in the Easter service and, and felt like, and he said, he, his words to me, I was an un, uneducated truck driver and farmer, and yet I felt like God was not done with me. And God, God had more for my life. So they now have been in Panama for 11 years, learned Spanish, living in Panama, sharing the gospel, with building churches there, uh, planting churches there. Right? Might that be what God does in your life? Maybe. Might it mean that you, you're here and you're faithful to share the gospel with your coworkers and your neighbors and you're faithful to give to things like Lottie Moon in order that people like Kenny and Cheryl can be on the field and, and to stay? Yeah. Is one better than the other? Is it better to be a missionary on the field and to be faithful there or to be faithful here in Frankfort, Kentucky? Yeah. What's the standard? The standard is faithfulness. Yeah. The standard is, what is God calling you to do? Then do that. And if that's moved to Panama, then you should move to Panama. If that's remain where you are here and to be faithful here, then do that. The, the goal here is faithfulness. And so understanding, we all have a part to play, and it's not going to look the exact same to everybody else. So, yes, we have a responsibility to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth, but we do have sort of levels of responsibility, and that's what we mean by these concentric circles of concern. So the very first concentric circle of concern at the very middle, well, I was going to draw these, but they're up here, is self, right? You, you, you cannot have a concern for somebody else's soul until you know that you are right with God, correct? You, you can't give away what you don't have. You, you can't share the gospel with other people, if you don't know the gospel, if you haven't trusted Christ. So that before you can worry about bringing anybody else to Jesus, you've got to make sure that you've come to Christ. That you have to, to know in your own heart that you've trusted Jesus. You, again, you can't give away what you don't have. You will not be effective evangelistically if you don't know Jesus. If you're not following Jesus, that you have a responsibility. Nobody else can do that for you. Your pastors can't do it for you. Your spouse can't do it for you. Your kids can't do it for you. No one else can come into your life and change your life and change your desires and cause you to trust Jesus. You can't. Or you've got to do that. You've got to trust Jesus. So your first concentric circle of concern is yourself. Outside of that is your family. So even within family, we, we might, right, you might draw like a couple levels here, right? So center of your family we might children. Who bears, if you're, if you're a parent in here, who bears the greatest responsibility to evangelize your children? You do. Right? Does the church play a role in that? Sure. Hopefully we do. Does pastors play a role? Does Mel and the kids' ministry play a role? Does Scott and student ministry play a role? Absolutely. Right? We're, our job is to come alongside and to equip you. Right, to help you reach your, your kids with the gospel. But no one bears a greater responsibility for your family than you do. You are uniquely placed in your family in a way that nobody else is. Right, so your immediate family, your, your spouse, your, your children, you bear responsibility there. From, as we sort of move out from that, we, we might move to what used to be your immediate family. So your parents, your in-laws, your brothers and sisters, if you're an adult, right, that you're, you're pushing these people that are they're still family. They're not immediately Immediate family, they're not your spouse or your children, but they're still family. You might go even further out. So I, I, I don't, my family's not super close so as you sort of begin to go out. I don't know a ton of my aunts and uncles and great aunts. And I don't, right, Hannah knows everybody for like 19 generations. So she, uh, when we were dating, I remember I met her, her uh, this lady that she called her Aunt Helen. And Aunt Helen was like 94 years old. And I was like, that is your dad's sister? And she was like, no, it's like my great, great, great Aunt Helen. Well, like, I don't know any of my great aunts, so I didn't know that that, like, existed. I didn't know people knew those people. I thought they were all dead and everybody else's family, right? So <laughs> maybe, maybe you've got a really big extended family, and so that's going to look different for everybody as far as the relationships you have, the access that you have for, for those people, right? The ways, the times that you're around them, the relationships you have, the opportunities you have to be in your, your life. Maybe you're, you have a family that's really close and you, your family gets together often and you do know a lot of that extended family. You have, you have a responsibility. God has placed you in that family. You are a believer. You have more responsibility for those people than a stranger does, than I do, because you are uniquely placed in this family. So immediate family, uh, brother, sisters, mom, dad, and then 
extended family, cousins, aunts, great aunts, second cousins, twice removed, whatever this looks like for your family, right? That, that as you have opportunity, you have a responsibility there for your family, right? Which we kind of put in there, relatives, right? So this would be, that, that would be that sort of outside circle, more people uh, sort of moving out from your family. And from there, you have a responsibility to your friends, right? Who, who do you think has more standing to speak to spiritual matters with your friends, me or you? You do. Why? Because you know them, right? That's exactly right. You know them. You have a relationship that they, there is a level of trust there that they may not have with me. Especially, I would argue, especially now, 50 years ago, pastors were seen different in, in most communities, right? 50 years ago, uh, pastors had some level of authority to speak into people's lives, even if they didn't know them, right? People, even people who didn't go to church had a level of respect for pastors of any denomination, right? They're just the, the the preacher was sort of held up in honor and that was seen in a generally a good light. That generally is not the case anymore. In Frankfurt, we're still enough of the Bible Belt that that's not totally flipped, but it is not the same. We're, pastors are not seen the same way. Fifty years ago, you might be able to bring your friend to a pastor and, and he might have some level of authority to be able to speak into their life and to, right, they might listen. Most of the time, that's not going to happen now. Uh, every now and then, but that's generally not the way that people see pastors anymore. Uh, it's, it's not, nationally, I would argue, it's totally flipped. Uh, just national culture, rather than reverence for pastors and, and clergy, that it's the opposite, that we're sort of seen as bad people. We're not trusted. They don't want us in their communities. Uh, here, I, don't, I would argue in Frankfurt, in this area, it's not totally flipped, but we're seen with more skepticism than we were 50 years ago. So you have a greater opportunity and responsibility with your friends than I do, right? Do I think you should invite them to church so Dr. York can preach the gospel and they can hear it? absolutely, but you have a responsibility in your relationship that you have with them to share the gospel with them. I, I've heard Dr. York before, somebody says, hey, I've got a friend, I'm going to bring him to you, and I want you to share the gospel with him. And I've heard Dr. York say, I'm happy to share the gospel with him, but have you shared the gospel with him? Uh, yeah, bring him to me, I'll talk to him, but I want you, you're their friend, I want you to share the gospel with him. Right? That this is not a, you just bring him to me and I'll do it for you. You are their friend, you have a relationship. Invite him to church, bring him to things, but you have a responsibility because they're your friend in order to share the gospel. Make sense? Any questions so far? All right. So outside of that, we move, we move to neighbors and associates, right? Acquaintances. People who live near you, right? Nobody else lives in your house but you, right? Your neighbors are your neighbors. I don't, your neighbors are not my neighbors. Unless you live like two houses down from me, then we might share a neighbor, right? But the people that live next to you are not there by accident. Where you live, no matter where that is, you're not there by accident. God has placed you there. God has given you particular neighbors that you might build relationships. Right? You have a responsibility to your neighbors. You're a Christian, and you got put where you are on purpose that you might be a light into dark places. So maybe all of your neighbors are believers. Praise God. That's great if all your neighbors are Christians. Most of us, if we're honest, do you know about the spiritual state of your neighbors? Do you know? Are they Christian? Do you do you know who they are? Do you know what's going on in their life? Right? You're a believer. You are uniquely placed right next to them in a way that I'm not, in a way that other people aren't. That You are placed there for a reason. So people who live near you, uh, associates, acquaintances, these are people that we wouldn't necessarily consider friends. We're not, let's say, spend a lot of time with them, but people that we know. Right? The list of people that we know is much longer than the list of people that we are, would consider friends, especially close friends. These are people that you might work with, people that you might know through friends, a friend of a friend. Right? That you have some level of responsibility there because you have some level of connection. And we're going to talk about in just a minute what it looks like to maybe sometimes move people up this ladder, right? to, to, to bring them into a, a closer circle. Uh, so neighbors, associates, acquaintances, and then, oh, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong thing. You got it now. Uh, and then person X. So this is, you strike up a conversation with somebody in Kroger, in the line, uh, uh, trying to wait to get your groceries, or at the doctor's office, or at the pharmacy, or wherever you are. This is somebody you don't know. They're not an acquaintance. They're not your neighbor. You don't have any reason necessarily to like have a connection with them, but you run into them. You meet them. It is what would seemingly be to us a random encounter that we Know that it's not random, but it's not something that somebody that you're going to have an ongoing relationship with, right? They're the outside, they're the outside circle, right? Should we share the gospel with them? Yes. 
Do I have the same responsibility to track the person next down after my first conversation with him as I do my, my daughter? No, right? I have a greater responsibility to her than I do random person X. But we ought to seek to share the gospel. Uh, we ought to seek, seek to share the gospel with, with them all, right? So these are the people uh, that, that we're working with. What I want to do for a few minutes, yeah, what I want to do for a few minutes is I, w- I want to ask you to get in groups of four to five, three, four, five, whatever works. And I'm going to ask you a few questions and because we'll, we'll, I'm going to talk through this a little bit and some ways we can grow in this and think through this. And then I want you to talk about those questions together as a group, and then we'll come back together and talk about some of these questions totally, right, all together as a group as we work through some of these things. So take a second, get together with people who are around you, three, four, five, whatever's convenient, and then I'll, I'll give you some questions to, to think through. All right, you can stay in your group. Uh, you can just stay where you are. In your group, somebody tell me, what was the most comfortable? Somebody said, Hey, this is this is where we're most comfortable sharing the gospel in this circle. Family is more of the immediate family. Immediate family is the most. Yeah. 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 So immediate immediate family. All right. How many people would say immediate family is where you're most comfortable? Anybody? Would anybody say immediate family is where you're most uncomfortable? Yeah, right? So this is part of the point is I want to see what's really comfortable for some people is the opposite for other people. Okay, somebody else, what was uh, the circle you said you're most comfortable with? Person X, right? Random person. Why, why are they the easiest or most comfortable? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, the risk seems low. If they don't like me, I'll just say, you know, my name is Herschel York. Nice to meet you. Uh, just go on. <laughs> yeah, so it seems like there's a low risk. You don't know them. You don't expect to have a relationship. If they don't like you, if they think you're weird or crazy, it's easy enough to sort of move on for some people. Does anybody say person X is the most uncomfortable? So why would person X be most uncomfortable? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to have that inertia to, can I actually get to the gospel? Do I, if I see an opportunity, do I actually take it? Yeah. So for me, I, that's me. Person X is the hardest, right? Is the... <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so for some people, it's person X is the easiest. For some people, it's the hardest. Again, part of this understanding who you are, how God's put you together. Now, what I want to say here is to say, I'm not saying that because it's more comfortable or less comfortable for you, that therefore you get to opt out of one of these, right? That it's, it's helping to know, hey, I'm going to need to be more intentional with person X because that's harder for me. Or I'm going to need to be more intentional with my family because that's harder for me. Understanding the way we're put together. There's lots of reasons that we are the way that we are. But understanding, hey, this, per- this is harder for me. I, I need to be more intentional here. I need to, to work harder to improve here, uh, to be better here so that I can do that. Okay, uh, any other, another one, somebody said most comfortable? Work. work. So like acquaintance, people you work with. Why, why so? And they'll be back tomorrow and the next day. And you know, right, there is, it's, there's some built-in longevity there that you know you're going to get a chance. If I don't get to everything now, I, I'll, get, I'll get another shot. I get to come back around. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else say work is most comfortable for you? And we all say work is least comfortable for you, right? So again, a part of this is not just your personality and how God's put you together, but part of it is where you work, right? So some places are easier, some places are more open, some places are less easier and less open, right? And so part of this is depending on where God has placed you, that it might be easier or, or harder. Again, it doesn't mean you get to opt out. It just means you get to try to be wise and to think, here's the place that God has put me. Here's how God has put me together. How can I be intentional with the, with the ways that God has, uh, has put me together? You can, you can come out of your groups now. Um, we're going to talk through some things together. As a, uh, I was going to give you this one as a group, but we'll just do it all together. So thinking through some of these. So let's take, let's take person X, for example. Maybe you're a person that, you're, you'll talk to anybody, doesn't, you're happy to start conversation, person X is easiest for you, or maybe you're somebody who says, I don't, right, when I'm in the grocery store, I keep my eyes down, so that hopefully I don't have to make, I, I'll wander around for a half hour before I'll ask somebody where something is, right, I, or maybe that's you, right, 
no matter where you are, how do we begin to take person X, right? Not every person you meet and have a conversation with are you going to be able to build a relationship with, correct? But some people, you should, right? There should be opportunities. There will be opportunities in your life in which people that you meet, you will have an opportunity to move them up the ladder, right? That They'll go from just some person that you meet at the store, that they might be, become an acquaintance and might then become a friend. So what's a way that we could take person X and we could begin to move them up? So maybe you meet them in the grocery store. Maybe you met them when we did Reach Frankfurt and you knocked on their door and you prayed for them there. Being intentional with the things you're going to do anyway. Right? You've got to get a haircut. You're going to go to the store. You're going to go out to eat. I think I talked about last week what, the way Zach Thurman was with La Fiesta, right? That, if you go to Lafayette now, those guys still ask. If they know you're from Buck Run, they'll ask you about Zach. They'll ask, how's Zach doing? Because he, he lived there, right? That he, <laughs> he was there all the time. But those guys know, those guys know him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those guys know him, and they're, they are connected. He, he was in their life. When, when crisis happened in the life of some people who worked there, they called Zach Thurman, right? That he was intentional. He was going to go out to eat anyway. And he knew in the course of just life, we're going to end up out anyway. If we just go to the same place, we'll get to know these people. And he was intentional. So, yeah, using the things that you, you do it anyway, where, where can you leverage that? I know Dr. York goes to us, the restaurant in town. They try to go at the same time and ask for the same waitress. Right? They're using that as a way to try to leverage what they already do for the sake of building relationships so that it goes beyond simply, here's a waitress that I met one time versus, now I'm, I've had conversations with this person over the course of eight months, nine months, a year, that there is more trust there, more opportunity to, to be in their life and share the gospel. Do you have one? Yeah. yeah, that's good. And I'll tell you, that's intentional on our part. One, we want to serve our community. But two, uh, and Dr. York talks about this a lot, is that for a lot of people, one day they'll wake up and something will happen in their life and they'll say, I need to go to church. And what they base that decision on where they go is going to often be a, f- a combination of factors of where have they been, where, who was kind to them. And so it's part of the reason of hosting community things is we want people in our building so that maybe they won't go when somebody asks them, but maybe when their life is falling apart and they decide, you know, I'm going to go to church. You know, I've been to that one up the street. I mean, I'll, maybe I'll go there, that we want to have that opportunity to be in their life. But, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it, it, God has a, u- a way of using those crises, right, to, to try to draw people uh, to us. Yeah. All right, let's, let's talk about, I'm going to go ahead. This is your homework. We're going to talk about how to do your homework for the next week. To formulate a top ten list of people with whom to share Christ. Now, I know in 19 we focused on who's your one. I think you, you should still have a one. You should still have some particular people, as even as we think about the concentric circles, people that you are, are most responsible for, you have most opportunity, right, that you, you have a chance to be able to share the gospel. But I think it's helpful for us as we pray and we, we every day are seeking to go to the Lord to have a list of people that we're praying for, right? to have a list of people that we're going to, to, uh, to the Lord for and asking for opportunity either for ourselves or asking maybe for the Lord to bring other people, right, to, into their life that they might um, be able to hear the gospel, that we're, we're praying for these people. Uh, a top ten list of, of people with whom to share Christ. So thinking through uh, your responsibilities, your relationships, the opportunities you have. Who are people that you could you'd be praying for? So, so a few ways to, to think through doing this. First, we have to seek to be right with God and with others. Right? We talked about your first concentric circle is yourself. You can't give away what you don't have. You won't be evangelistically effective if you're not walking with Jesus. Right? That God helps us in these things. He gives us the words to say. He opens our eyes to the opportunities that are before us. Right? We have to be walking with Christ. You have to be repenting of your sin, trusting Christ, walking in him, participating in the spiritual disciplines, hearing the word preach, reading your Bible, praying, right? walking with Jesus. That matters for you. And second, you have to be right with others. Right? So Paul tells Timothy that as best as he's able to, to live at peace with other people. Nothing will hurt your opportunities to share the gospel with other people than being a cantankerous person, right? If you are known as a difficult person, you will, uh, you will limit the amount of opportunities you have with other people. I think I shared last week guys that I went to college with who just were not very nice guys. They were abrasive. They were rude. And that they sort of wore as a badge of honor, we're rejected for Jesus. Well, no, you're rejected because you're a jerk. This is nothing... <laughs> 
There's nothing to, your rejection, the reason that people don't want to be around you and don't, that these unbelievers don't want to speak to you has very little to do with Jesus, and you're actually hurting the rest of us because we get lumped in. We, they assume that we're mean like you. That they assume that all Christians are like this, and therefore they don't want to have anything to do with all Christians. Right? As best as we are able, we ought to live at peace with all men. We have a responsibility to, to do that. To make peace where we can make peace, to mend relationships where we can mend relationships, to apologize and to ask forgiveness when we're wrong, right? to do what we can. Now, does that mean that every relationship you have that is in turmoil is going to be able to be mended? No. Right? We can't control other people. We can't control circumstances. What we can control is ourselves. And we can seek to be, take the initiative and to make mends. We can take the initiative to apologize, to seek res- restoration, to seek forgiveness, to seek to see these relationships mended wherever possible. That's not always going to be possible. Or that, that's not always going to be possible on our side. But we want to do everything we can to live at peace with other people. If you're known as a peaceable person, it will not only keep opportunities for you, it will open new opportunities for you. The people will trust you. It buys you credibility when they know this is not a cantankerous person. Right? This is not a person who likes to argue. This is not a person who likes to hold grudges. This is a, a kind, gentle, compassionate person who's willing to admit when they make a mistake, who's at, willing to ask for forgiveness, who's not willing to let relationships stand when they are, are separated, but instead will we'll take initiative to make men's, Right? Every one of us is a sinner, and every relationship that we have in our life is with another sinner. So when you put two sinners together in any sort of relationship, whether that be spouse, whether that be parent-child, pastor, congregant, co-workers, neighbors, when you put two sinners together, often what you get is friction because it's, it's what we are. We're sinners. We, we make mistakes. As best as we're able, we ought to, to mend relationships where we can that they, we might have more opportunity to share the gospel, right? The, you're never going to be able to be perfect in this life, but where you can, Men relationships, it buys you credibility. It, it creates opportunities for you to share the gospel. You can't grow relationships that you've not mended, right? That you have these opportunities to fix this. Does that make sense? So live at peace. Paul says live at peace as best as you're able with all men. Right? It's not always going to be possible, but we can do our best. Third, as you think through this top ten list, survey your relationships with others. Think about the relationships that you have in your life. Where has God placed you? What doors might be open? Where do you work? Who are your neighbors? Who are your family? Right? What, what thing, what relationships do you already have? Now, again, remember we want to start here because God has called us right, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, but lest we get so focused on the ends of the earth that we miss out the things that God has put right in front of us, right? that sometimes we can get so focused on the, the, sort of the next thing or the big thing that we forget about the thing that is, that is right in front of us, the opportunities that God is opening for, for us. What relationships do you have? What opportunities has God already given you that maybe you've not taken advantage of yet, that, that maybe you have these relationships, you have this coworker, you have this relationship at work with a neighbor or an acquaintance, that you know, here's an opportunity. The truth is, we often pray for opportunity. God is always giving us opportunity. We need to pray for greater discernment to see and to take advantage of the opportunities that God is, is giving us. I, I think I've told this story a lot. Uh, I still think about it. It was probably, now it was probably a decade ago almost. I was visiting, I was a pastor in Lawrenceburg, and I was visiting a, a guy uh, who was dying uh, at a hospital. I'd gone in and spent half hour with him and prayed with him and uh, read the scriptures to him and and was sort of just had that on my mind and had a busy day and was going from there to another thing and just just had in my mind I just got I've got more to do today than I've got time to do it and so I was just so I've got to do this and then I get the next thing and I was standing at the elevator to leave the hospital and there's a, there was a woman on, sitting on the bench right by the elevator and she was clearly upset she was crying and here I am I'm sitting there I'm holding my bible and she looks up and asks me are you are you a pastor and I said, yes, yes, I am. And about that time, the elevator opened, and I got in the elevator, and I pushed my floor, and I went down, and I went to the parking garage, got in my car, and I was halfway home before I realized that was an opportunity that I just blew. Right? I was just so, it didn't, it didn't dawn on me in the moment. I was so focused on the next thing. Okay, this, this, this was good. I got this next thing. Also a good thing I got to go do. I got to get to this thing so that I can do that, so I can get this other thing, so I get this other thing. I was so focused on the things I had to do that when God like teed one up for me, I just, right, she's crying. I have a Bible. She says, are you a pastor? And I'm like, yep, see ya, right? Just, 
I, I'll tell you, it still sits with me. That was a decade ago. It still sits with me. I don't know her. I don't know what's going on in her life. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Right? I don't know what would have happened. I don't, I don't know what opportunity was there. I don't know if she was a believer and just needed comfort. I don't know if she was an unbeliever and was asking for help. I, I, or I don't know if she was just curious about who I was. Well, I don't know. And I'll never know. It was an opportunity that I had that I missed. We have so many of those like that. Like God, God puts us in, per, in particular places at particular times for particular reasons, and we're asking for discernment. So survey the relationship that you have. Your job, your work, your school, where you live. It's not by accident. God has placed you there for a reason, for a purpose. So survey them. Where might God be leading you? And then in that process, pray for guidance. Ask the Lord, God, what are you doing here? What, what relationships have you put in my life that I might be able to, to use? What, what, what people should I really be praying for? What people should I seek to, to build greater relationships with God? Where, where are the open doors? Where are the places that you're making a way for me to go? Ask for the Lord's help. Right? So I'm not saying you just have to figure this all out on your own. But we pray and we ask for wisdom. We ask for guidance from the Lord. What does this look like? God, help me to do this. And then next, begin to build relationship bridges. This is many of the things that we've talked about. And so maybe it's person X, and you, you buy their meal for them, or you, you leave a, a larger tip, or you, right, you, you go to the same barber every single week, that you're, you're beginning to try to build that relationship. Or maybe it's a, a co-worker, right? They're, they're already to a, a closer to the inner circle, that you know them more. There's already more of a relationship there. Maybe it's you look for ways to be intentional, to ask about what's going on in their life. And then to say, hey, can I, can I be praying for you? And then follow up a week later and say, hey, I know you shared with me the thing that's going on with your mom. And I've been praying for you this week. How's that going? Right? That, that takes the relationship of a coworker and sort of moves it to a deeper relationship. Right? You're, you're seeking to say, what ways can I take this relationship and actually build on it? Actually begin to deepen it. How can I pray for you? How can I care for you? Right? That you're looking for ways to build, to build bridges. There are a million ways to do this. Uh, ways to, to build bridges to, in order to, to, to move on and to move uh, these relationships this up. In this, we show each person love by meeting needs. Right? It's one of the ways we build bridges. We can demonstrate the love of Jesus by meeting a need. Maybe the need is they're about to buy a meal, right? and we can meet that need by buying it for them. All right? Maybe the need is it's the holidays and we leave a larger tip. Or maybe the, the need is uh, their mother is sick and you're praying for them. Whatever that need is, we're seeking to show the love of Jesus by where we can meeting needs. Right? Now, it's important here to say we want to meet the needs that they have, not the needs that we think they have. Get the difference there? That sometimes we want to meet the needs that we think people have or that we assume they have or we wish that they had rather than to meet the needs that we, they actually have. Do you have anybody in your life that that's the way they give presents? They don't, give, they don't give you the gift that, that you want or that you need or that you desire. The way they give gifts is they give you the thing that they want you to have, right? which is a different thing, right? That giving a gift that I'm giving this to you because I want you to have it is not the same thing as I'm giving it to you because I think you'll enjoy it or I think you'd like it or I think you would desire it or I think it's right. Uh, this is more about me than it is for you. When I give you a gift that I, I give it to you because I want you to have it, that is ultimately more about me than it is about you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So sometimes the way that we care for other people is that we meet needs they don't have. We say, I'm going to do this for you because I want to do something for you. And essentially we're doing it sometimes more for ourselves than for them. Because we feel better about ourselves. We can sort of pat ourselves on the back and say, you did a kind thing for somebody. You did this for... We can slip that into conversation about how we did this for somebody. We, we, we like to sometimes do these things for our own self rather than to actually legitimately meet a need. Part of what it means to build relationships with people is to get to know them so that you understand what their needs actually are. And so that you can meet the needs that they really have, if you're able to, right? If you have opportunity, if you can meet those needs, that's the way we show the love of Jesus. Is we, we help to where we are able to meet the needs of Christ. That often buys us a ton of credibility in relationships. It gives us a way to demonstrate to them the love of Jesus, even as we're trying to tell them of the love of Jesus, Right? Both things are necessary. We want to demonstrate the love of Jesus, and we want to verbally say, here's, here's why I'm doing this. Here's why, why I, this, is, this is part of what I do because of the love of Christ, and we get to tell them the gospel. So how do you, how do you find the needs that people have? Right? So if we want to meet the needs they really have, we want to show them love by meeting needs, how do you, you find what their need actually is? Communication. Communication. What do you mean by that? Talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? So an easy way is to ask. Right? So you've got a coworker 
and their spouse is sick. I mean, their spouse has cancer, right? So even as you, you talk and you say, I'm, I'm going I'm to be praying for you. Can I put this on my community group prayer list? We're going to be praying for your husband or for your wife. Would it be helpful if I made you some meals this week? I would love to do it so that you didn't have it. Would that be helpful for you, right? Maybe they say, yes, you know what? That would be really helpful. I, I really appreciate that. Or maybe they say, you know what, actually my mother-in-law is in town, and that's what she does. She just cooks all day, so no, right? But the way you find, figure that out is by asking. Or maybe you just say, I, I, I want to care for you. What, what would be helpful for you this week? What could I do for you? Can I, can I go grab you lunch? Get, right? Often the things we do have to do with food, right? But it's, one of the ways we do that is by communicating, is by asking. What else? What's another way you can begin to discern people's needs? Yeah, yeah, you're listening. So sometimes more than talking, the way we figure out needs that people have is by listening carefully to what they say. The, the people, especially people as we begin to build these relationships, people will begin to share their needs. Not always explicitly, but if you read between the lines, if you begin to listen to what they say, you'll begin to understand uh, and to see some of their need and begin to pick that out. The more you do this, the more you seek to care for people, the better, you, better you'll get at it. Right? It's, you grow in this and understanding and discerning people's needs. But this is part of what we do as believers, right? That we want to be like Jesus. We want to be those who show love and compassion and kindness. And so we want to read people. We want to understand their needs. Jesus did this, right? Woman at the well. He, he is able to diagnose. He knows exactly what she needs. He, he offers her exactly what she needs. This is what we want to do. We want to discern what, what people need in life. Often that comes from listening really carefully to what they say. Uh, and, and understanding that they will, if we're, if we're listening, they often will uh, expose what their need is so that we, we can meet it. Last, last one, along the way, share the gospel, right? So we want to say we're not, as we seek to, to think about these 10 people, as we seek to build relationships and bridges and move relationships along and look for places to share the love of Jesus in practical ways, right? What, what I'm not saying is that there is like some relationship line, right? And then you, know, you got you to gotta be here on the chart, and this is where you share the gospel, right? This is like the special zone, or you've had a relationship this long, and you've done this many things, and you've, right, and it's here, okay, here, finally, you share the gospel, here, this is when you do it, and so you're like, oh, I'm just building a relationship now, but you down the line, I've got April pegged, right, April's the month, I think we'll be there, and then I'll share the gospel then, right, no, we look for whatever opportunity that we have as we're seeking to build relationships, as we're, we're trying to show the love of Jesus, as we're caring for people, as we're building bridges, whatever open doors we have, we try to share the gospel. And maybe we get shut down. Maybe we don't get very far. Maybe we just get a, a conversation that we might call a spiritual conversation. We're not able to get fully to the gospel, but, but we're have, able to have a spiritual conversation. So uh, you might illustrate that and say you, you, you're outside with your neighbor and and your neighbor asks you about church, or you invite them to church, and, and maybe your neighbor asks you what we might think of as sort of an out there theological question. Right? Well, you, you know, do, my dog died this, this week. Does my, does my dog go to heaven? Right? It's a weird question, but it's a little question a lot of unbelievers ask. Right? Uh, by the way, we don't know. It's easy. <laughs> right? The Bible doesn't, will there be animals in the new heaven and new earth? Yeah, right? There will be animals in the new heaven and earth. We, know, we do know that. There's this new creation. Will your dog be in the new heaven and new earth? The Bible is silent. It doesn't say that it will. It doesn't say that it won't. It's silent. One thing we do know for sure, your cat will not be in heaven. We do know that for sure. Your cat won't be. <laughs> your cat will not be. Dogs may be. Cats, cats, no. But anyway, so you, you get asked this question that might take you on a rabbit trail. So maybe... As you're trying to answer this question, and then you're trying to get to the gospel, right? They say, hey, he's a good talk. I got to go. I got this thing. Maybe you don't get all the way there. I want you to understand from an evangelistic standpoint, I don't see that as failure, right? Are we trying to get to the gospel every time? Yes, right? Might there be some, uh, some false starts before we, we move a conversation all the way to the gospel? That, that spiritual conversation about some spiritual topic that you're able to begin, but you, you're not able to, all, to get all the way to the gospel, might begin to allow, lay the groundwork that next time your neighbor has a spiritual question, you were willing to have a conversation. Maybe they come to you. Or it gives you an opportunity. Hey, they brought up spiritual things. You get, next time, you get to ask the question, right? You get to, to hey, what do, you, what do you think about heaven, right? Do you, do you believe that there is a heaven, right? And you can begin, you can begin the conversation, and you might be able to, to 
better dictate where you go and get to the gospel. So we're looking along the way wherever we can to share the gospel. We're going to talk uh, next week and a little bit the week after about some methods to share the gospel. How do, how do you move into conversation from spiritual things or from non-spiritual things to spiritual things and then from generically spiritual conversation, how can you get to the gospel? How can you move that to Christ uh, to think through that? So, but along the way, share the gospel. Look for opportunities. They're there. Where they're there, take them, right? Take them. Trust the Lord. Ask for the Lord's help. Ask for the Lord's forgiveness when you realize that you missed it, that you, you didn't, there was an opportunity you didn't take, and ask the Lord for another one. Last two things here. The, the thing that satisfies the deepest longing of your being is a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is true for every single human. That we will find our ultimate satisfaction. We will find ultimate fulfillment in Jesus and in Jesus alone. We, we will not find it in anywhere else. Um, I, I saw even just yesterday, um, a, somebody tweeted out a, a clip from a, an interview with, uh, with Will Smith, the actor. And he, he talked about the way that uh, he had, uh, when he began in, in sort of the uh, industry, his goal was to make a ton of money and to be the biggest movie star and to be really famous and to have access to tons of things. And, and he said that they, he hit a point in his life where he realized, I cannot uh, achieve my way out of the hurts of my life. Right? And I can't achieve my way out of my childhood wounds and scars. Right? And so he, he, his thing was I just began then to try to care for other people and try to improve other people's lives. And, uh, and the truth is, you, there are tons of people in your family, your job, in your neighborhood, in relationships and friends that you have that are seeking to find some sort of fulfillment, some sort of happiness, some sort of joy in anything and everything but Jesus. And yet we are the ones who know that will never happen. That there is only ultimate satisfaction, fulfillment, and joy in Christ. And we, we believe that we have that. So our responsibility is to share that with other people. We want them to find that joy and satisfaction, fulfillment, and we want them to find it in Jesus because they will find it nowhere else. So you should want all the people in your life to satisfy or to, to, to experience this satisfaction. But we have a deep desire to, to see people do that, that we share the gospel, not as uninterested observers saying, hey, here's a thing, take it or leave it, but we're sharing the gospel and saying we want you to believe. This is good. I want this for you. I, I want good things for you. Uh, one of the old catechisms says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Many of you probably know Piper, has, Piper and others have tweaked that by, by saying the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever, that God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him, that when we find satisfaction in Christ, he brings him glory. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We want that. We know that in Christ. We want that for everybody in our life. And Revelation 21, 3 4 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That we, we know that there is this hope coming, that, that this is uh, something that is coming because God is redeeming all things. He is reconciling all things to himself. That this is our hope as believers, right? That one day this is going to be true, that he will come for us. We want this for every single person in our life. We don't want them under the judgment of God, but instead we want them to find this joy and hope and mercy and forgiveness in Jesus. Right? That if we're honest, most of us need to pray that God would give us a better and a deeper burden for the people in our life who are lost, that we would see them in their lostness and have a burden that they would trust Jesus, that, they, that we would feel a greater urgency to build that relationship, a greater urgency to share the gospel, a greater urgency to share the love of Jesus, that they may too know the same joy that we know in Jesus. So this week, I want you to take some time, do the things we've talked about, pray, ask the Lord for the Lord's guidance, think through your relationships, and, and spend some time. Use this, this additional notes page and write down 10 people. Right? If you get eight people, that's fine. If you get six people, that's fine. But write down a list. Here are people that I can be specifically praying for. So that when you pray, rather than just praying for God, be with the lost people and help them to trust you. Right? Pray for lost people. But let's pray for some lost people by name. I pray for the lost in my community. I pray specifically for John. 
And I pray you would help me to, to know how to share the gospel with him. I pray specifically for my coworker Bill. And I, I pray for this thing that's going on in his life. And God, I pray that you would use this crisis and give me an open door to be able to share with him the hope of Jesus. Pray for people specifically. Put them on your list. One of my favorite things as a pastor is every week reading our prayer requests and seeing week after week after week people putting the same name down and praying for this person. Praying that they would come to know Jesus. Uh, and and I, I, man, I so appreciate the longevity of just somebody saying, every week I'm praying for this person. They don't, they don't know Jesus yet, so I'm still praying. Right? That they're on the list, and, and they're, they're asking for prayer. I'm praying for Bill, that he would trust Christ, and to see that come up week and week. I'm praying for the day that we don't see those names on there anymore because they've trusted Christ. I'm praying for the day we see, praise God, Bill trusted Jesus today. And, uh, pray for me as I try to disciple him, as I help, try to help him know what it means to follow Jesus. All right. any, any questions, comments for what we've covered today? All right, let me pray for us, and, and we'll close. Father God, we thank you for uh, your kindness to us. We thank you for the ways in which you have cared for us. Uh, we thank you for the hope and the mercy that we find in Jesus. Uh, Father, we pray that you would burden our hearts for the lost people in our lives and in our, in our community. Father, we, we pray that you would give us eyes to see them. And we pray that you would give us not only opportunity, but the wisdom to know the opportunities that you give us, that we wouldn't miss them. Give us boldness to speak. Give us the words to say, go before us in these conversations. Father, we pray that, that he is a result uh, of thinking through and praying for lost people and being more mindful. Father, we pray that more people would come to faith in Jesus, that they would hear the good news of the gospel and that they would believe and be saved. Father, we pray that you would do that work in and, and through us. Uh, Father, we pray that even now as we go uh, to service, we know that there will be people in that room today who have not trusted you. And so, Father, we pray that today might be the day of salvation, that today that they would see Christ in all of his splendor and all of his glory, that they would see him and see the mercy and forgiveness that he offers and that they might repent of their sins and trust him. Father, we pray that today that there would be some that would cross from death to life, that they would know Jesus today, and that, that they would become for us brothers and sisters. We pray for our pastor as he opens up the word. We pray that you would give him the words to say, move his voice, uh, give him dexterity of mind and, and clarity of, of uh, voice. And Father, that he might be able to clearly declare uh, the excellencies of Christ, that we might know the gospel and believe and be saved. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.